Good morning, everybody. Welcome. This is, um, how many of you know that what we're doing here is probably a first for our church? Um, this is, um, I don't know whether to credit or blame Phil for what we're doing this morning. Um, he and I had been talking for some time. He had been wanting to do an outdoor service, uh, more than one. And, he, and we thought, well, why can't we just do it here? And then a few months ago, I was approached, Kira approached me and she says, hey, can I talk to you? And I thought, oh, oh great. Uh, what did I do now? And so she, she sat me out. We talked for a few minutes in, the, uh, in my office and she expressed a desire to want to be baptized. And so we thought, hey, why don't we pair these two up? And this is where we've come to this morning. So it's really exciting the morning. Um, Kira and her family, good to see you guys here this morning to celebrate that. We'll be getting to that here in a little bit, um, but it is just, it is great to see how God works and gives us an opportunity. I mean, we, we could have, I don't know that we could have asked for a better morning to do something like this. Uh, it's, I'm standing here, I don't have to worry about preaching with sunglasses on and we're not here in a downpour. And so we've got enough overcast and enough warmth to make it enjoyable. So I'm just uh, thankful for all that God has done to bring us here to this point, to be able to stand here and to be able to worship God together. January 23rd, 1992. Uh, January 23rd, 1992 is probably not a significant date for many of you. But for me, that particular date was, is very significant. That particular date was when I raised my hand as a young 17-year-old and took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States and of the state of Oregon. That was the date that I joined the Oregon Army National Guard. It began a more than 30-year career that took a young, very innocent, naive, private to a not-so-young major by the time I retired from the National Guard. One of the things that I learned over the course of those 30 years is that a soldier is a part of a team. And not only a part of a team, a team that has many different parts, but a team that focuses on the execution of one particular mission. There's one mission that the U.S. military ex executes to protect our nation and defend the Constitution. But I also learned very quickly the truth of this particular statement. There's the right way, the wrong way, and the Army way. For those of you who have served, you know what I mean. For the past several months, we've been going through a sermon series, a sermon series that looks at, the very, at what it means to be a part of a very different organization. It, in this case, we're talking about Church Venture Northwest, Venture Church Network, which is our parent body. These two organizations represent a fellowship of churches beginning here in Lyons, stretching out to the Oregon coast, the Pacific Northwest, and really across around the globe. We have, as an organization, we have four values that are central to who we are as an organization. And this series has been, uh, um, in part, to help us understand what those four values mean to us. In March, we looked at what it means to be gospel-driven, and we spent four weeks in Romans. In April, we were in Psalm 119, seeking to understand what it means to be biblically focused. May saw us devote Acts chapters 1 and 2 to understand what it means 
to be disciple making. And finally, over the course of the last four weeks, we've been studying the value of being relationally committed as we've been taking a deep dive into 1 Corinthians chapter 12. All of this has been so that we might learn to understand that the people of God gather together for the purpose of fulfilling a common mission. That's been the theme throughout the last several months. And this morning, we're going to wrap up that series. And I think it's an appropriate way to do it this morning. We'll do so by looking at what is perhaps one of the most familiar chapters in all of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 13. In fact, this chapter has frequently been quoted often taken out of context, even by people who have no idea that they are quoting out of 1 Corinthians 13. Last Sunday, we looked at the first half of chapter 12, verse 31, the last verse in chapter 12. But the second half of the verse, the Apostle Paul says this, and I will show you a still more excellent way. For all that Paul has written to this point, regard, particularly with regard to the issues of spiritual gifts, the various parts of the body, how believers are supposed to conduct themselves, he says that there is a better way, a way that he has not talked about to this point. The title of this message this morning is A Common Association, The Necessary Way. This necessary way, as Paul lays it out in 1 Corinthians 13, is the way of love. As a matter of fact, the word that Paul uses for love is the word agape, a word that's probably familiar to you if you've had much connection with the church. It means to love someone or something based on a sincere appreciation and high regard, to regard someone with affection or loving concern. This type of love is a love that focuses on the well-being of others. It focuses on their best interests first and foremost. It describes the love that God the Father has for God the Son. It describes the love that the Father and the Son have for us. And it also describes the love that we are commanded to demonstrate to one another. So keeping this definition in mind, a sincere appreciation or high regard for others, a genuine deep affection for others, keeping this definition in mind, the point of this morning's message is this. The essential element in our relationships is a selfless affection for one another. The essential element in our relationships is a selfless affection for one another. So if you have your Bibles with you, either digitally or physical, turn to 1 Corinthians. And I'll read 1 Corinthians, the last part of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and all of 1 Corinthians 13. Here's what the Apostle Paul writes. And I show you a still more excellent way. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give my possessions to feed the poor, if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. It does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It, it, it does not seek its own. It is not provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. 
If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Let's pray as we get into God's Word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, in your wisdom, in your grace, you have demonstrated your love toward us. In your mercy, you have sought out a people that have not loved you, but you have loved us. Father, we are humbled that you have sent your Holy Spirit to work in men to give us the words that you desire us to have this morning. Father, I pray that this morning you would prepare our hearts and minds to receive the truth of your word. God, I pray that your word would do its perfect work in us so that we might become the people you desire us to be in order to live the life that you desire us to live and communicate the message you desire us to speak. Thank you for your word this morning, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if you recall in chapter 12, the Apostle Paul spends a great deal of time talking about parts of the body, the parts of the body, the gifts that define those parts of the body. He goes into great detail to talk about that. And evidently, the Corinthians were people who argued about this. Among their many problems, they were debating about the comparative value and the purpose of the gifts that were given to the church. They believed that some gifts had greater worth and others had lesser worth. They somehow felt that some people were of greater importance and others of lesser importance. And this was such a significant issue that some felt meaningless while others felt as if they were indispensable to the church. The first thing that we notice from our text this morning in 1 Corinthians 13 is that activity without love is worthless. Activity without love is worthless. We see this in verses 1 through 3. In verse 1, we see, we notice that eloquence without love possesses no harmony. Eloquence without love possesses no harmony. Here Paul is referencing the tongues of men and, of, and angels. And he's using a literary device called hyperbole. It's an exaggeration to make a point. Paul is not speaking of some sort of gibberish that in some circles today gets called angelic speech. What he is saying is that if someone could speak with the greatest amount of affection, with the greatest amount of, effect, of passion, to the point that your speech could even be considered angelic, but you do not have love, it possesses no benefit, no more than, a no than the noisy clanging of cymbals or the banging of a gong. I remember when I was a little kid, the gong show was still on. Those older than me will remember it better than I do. Somebody does something, they kind of reach over and hit a gong. That's the equivalent of what's going on here. However eloquent you speak, it has no more effect than that, no more benefit than that. I remember one Christian theologian and apologist 
who I had a tremendous amount of respect for, a man who, even today, if I could speak half as eloquently and make connections half as well as he did, I would consider myself blessed. This man, after he'd passed away, it came out that he had been living a secret and very sinful life. All that he had shared, all that he had done, this eloquent speech rings hollow to this day. You can be the epitome of eloquence in your speech, but if you don't possess love, there's no harmony in what is being communicated. Eloquence has its place, but eloquence should never be seen as evidence in itself of love. Activity without love is worthless, and the next way that we see it is that information without love possesses no significance. Information without love possesses no significance. We see this in verse 2. The Apostle Paul here is speaking of gifts of prophecy, of being able to understand all mysteries and all knowledge and possessing faith to the point that you can move mountains. Imagine being able to speak so powerfully that your words carry the authority of God. Or being able to comprehend as a scientist all of the detailed workings of creation from the smallest atom to the farthest galaxy, to be able to understand it, to be able to explain all of these mysteries, to have the most intelligent, to be the most intelligent and educated philosopher so that you can explain the greatest thoughts in the simplest way or possessing such an amount of faith that you see absolutely no obstacle whatsoever. Imagine what it would be like to be that type of person. Imagine what it would be like to have all of that information, all of that knowledge, to be so wise. In 2008, I graduated from seminary with a master's degree, probably near the bottom of my class. I had somebody tell me, what do you call a doctor who graduates last in his class? A doctor. I have friends of mine, classmates of mine, who have gone on to other educational institutions all around the world and now have doctorates that are pastoring large churches engaged in all of these ministries. However, what does all of this mean if we miss the point of developing a selfless affection for one another as God intends us to? All of this stuff is meaningless. It's valueless. Information without love possesses no significance. There's still one more way that activity without love is meaningless we see in verse 3, and that is sacrifice without love possesses no value. Sacrifice without love possesses no value. Paul describes giving up all of his possessions to feed the poor. Now, this would seem like a Good thing, right? You're sacrificing to help those who are most needy. Taking care of the poor is a good and right thing, right? That's what we think. However, if a person does this, if a person gives to the poor, not out of a godly, selfless love for the poor, but to be seen by others as being generous or perhaps to salve a guilty conscience, not out of love for God or others, but out of a love for self 
or legalistic righteousness, then it possesses no value. Paul speaks of surrendering my body to be burned. The New English translation renders this verse, this part of the verse, if I give my body over so that I might boast. Or if I, or the 2020 version of the New American Standard says, if I surrender my body so that I may glory. Essentially, what this is, is if I seek martyrdom for the sake of gaining glory for myself, this is a problem. Am I pursuing glory for myself? Am I pursuing myself? Am I doing what seems to be something so sacrificial, but it's all about me? Am I wanting glory for me, or am I wanting glory for God? Am I seeking my welfare, or am I seeking the glory of God and the welfare of others first? In the end, if we are doing this, we gain nothing without love. The essential element of our relationships is a selfless affection for one another. And the first way, the first thing that we have seen is that activity without love is worthless. Activity without love is worthless. But what do we learn about love from these verses from this chapter, what do we learn about love? We learn from verses 4 through 7 that authentic love is meaningful. Authentic love is meaningful. Look at verses 4 through 7 again. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We have a meaning for love, but what do these verses help us to see about what authentic love really is? Notice, first of all, that authentic love is positive. That is to say, we see what love is is what love possesses. In these four verses, Paul gives us six qualities that love possesses. Six qualities that love possesses. In verse 4, we see that love is patient. Love looks at life with the end in mind. Even though the route from here to the end may be unknown. Love is patient, keeping the end in mind. Second, love is kind. It looks for opportunities to provide something beneficial for others in a way that is uniquely meaningful to that person. You can give a gift to somebody that really isn't that meaningful. Flowers for my dad wouldn't mean that much. Flowers for my mom would mean a whole lot doing something kind with the other in mind. Love bears all things we see in verse 7. This comes from a word that carries the sense of protecting or warding off or supporting. It can mean to keep a secret or to keep a confidence. In this sense, what we see is that love is supportive or discreet. Do you keep a confidence? Are you discreet in your relationships with others? Love believes all things, or in this case, love is confident. Now, this doesn't mean that love is naive. It does mean, however, that love believes or assumes the best about others. Love has confidence that in the best about others. Love is hopeful, we see, which means that love looks for what God will do in others. Love has hope that God will have his perfect work in others. And then finally, we see that love 
endures all things or is persevering. It bears up under hardship. It keeps going. It does the work to maintain the relationship. It is willing to do the hard work to maintain the relationship. Love is positive because it possesses certain qualities. It is certain things. It is kind. It bears all things. A whole host of things as we have seen. However, love is also negative. What do I mean by that? Love is negative. That, what I mean by that is there are certain qualities that love does not, that love cannot possess. Love is certain things and it is not other things. And in these verses we see seven qualities that are absent from authentic love. Back in verse 4 we see that love is not jealous. Love isn't jealous. It is the same word that Paul used earlier at the end of chapter 12 when he describes earnestly desiring greater gifts. It carries the idea of having one's heart strongly set on something. Love here does not desire that which it has no legitimate claim to. It is not jealous. It does not set its heart on those things it should not set its heart on. Love does not boast, we see. It doesn't go around bragging about its own fame, praising its own achievements, touting its own success. Love does not boast. Related to this, we see that love is not arrogant, acting as if the world revolves around it. Those who authentically love do not see themselves as the answers to all of the world's problems. Love does not possess that quality. In verse 5, we see that love is not rude. The essence of what Paul is saying is this when he says that love does not act unbecomingly. It is not ugly or indecent in its behavior. It doesn't act in a way that is shameful or immoral in its behavior. It, be, it behaves properly. It does not behave improperly. Love is not self-serving, we see. It doesn't seek itself. It doesn't desire its own, whatever the cost. It is not about me. I used to tease my chaplain assistant. I would say, you exist for my benefit. You exist to make me look good. Love does not do that. Love is not irritable. That is to say, it is not easily provoked. It's not quick-tempered, and actually, to be honest with you, this is, this is one of the areas, as I was writing this, this is one of the areas where I felt convicted. I think Karen knows more than most that there's a reason why I have a coffee mug with, with Grumpy, the dwarf, the, one of the seven dwarfs. Love isn't easily irritable. It isn't easily, easily provoked. Finally, love is not resentful. It does not take into account a wrong suffered, Paul writes. Or some translations put it, it does not keep a record of wrongs. It is not embittered. It, is, it does not have an enemy's list. Love is not resentful. If we were to understand the true meaning of authentic love as Paul lays it out here in 1 Corinthians 13, we have to know what love is and what love is not. It possesses certain qualities and it does not possess others. However, there is one more important component to this definition of authentic love that gives love its meaning. And that is that authentic love is truthful. 
it can be the there can be the appearance that love that someone who loves possesses all of these qualities everything it should and should not possess but there's something else that's missing in verse 6 Paul says that love does not rejoice in unrighteousness but it re rejoices with the truth June is kind of one of those months that I have a little bit of a love-hate relationship with. In part because this month has been categorized by some as LGBTQ plus Pride Month. It is a time where people gather together to celebrate a collection of behaviors that the Bible calls sin. Just recently, under the guise of being loving, the Episcopal Church in the United States modified its logo to promote this sinful lifestyle. Why do I say this? Paul says that love does not rejoice with unrighteousness. In doing so, he uses a word that describes any act that is unjust, that is lawless or that is opposed to God's laws. He uses the same word in Romans chapter 1 in connection with a variety of sins. In Romans chapter 1 verses 28 to 32, he says this, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things that are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness. This is that word that he uses. Being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, envy, full of or evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, Malice, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And though they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not, they not only do the same, but they, give, they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Love takes no pleasure. It is not happy about. It does not celebrate anything that God condemns. Instead, love rejoices with the truth. We need to understand that love is not on the opposite end of the spectrum from truth. Love does not stand in opposition to the truth. Love is not in competition with the truth. Love and truth are necessary components to one another. In Ephesians 4.15, Paul refers to the thing that grounds us against deceitful men, and he says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, 22 and 23, saying, Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls in sincere love of the brethren, fervently will love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed that is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring Word of God. Without truth, love has no depth. It has no anchor. It has all the solidity and certainty of jello left outside on a warm day. There is no purpose or meaning to love if it is not grounded in the truth. Such a love is bound to fall. It is bound to fail. However, we see one more thing about love in this chapter. The essential element in our relationships 
is a selfless affection for one another. And as we have already seen, activity without love is meaningless, but authentic love is meaningful. The final thing we see in 1 Corinthians 13 is that authentic love is enduring. Authentic love is enduring. We see this in verses 8 through 13. This is what Paul writes. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know just as also I am fully known. But now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. At the start of verse 8, Paul says that love never fails. Literally, what he is saying is that love never falls. It is a word that can mean to stop or come to an end. Love does not end. In these verses, we see several ways in which love is enduring. First thing we see about the enduring nature of love is that authentic love exceeds the limitations of activities. Authentic love exceeds the limitations of activities. In verse 8, we find three gifts in particular that Paul references. He references prophecy and tongues and knowledge. Prophecy and tongues and knowledge. These three gifts were likely the ones that the Corinthian church was Pursuing, they were the ones that were the most prized gifts. Paul addresses prophecies and tongues specifically in the next chapter, the appropriate context of those. And he has already addressed the issue of knowledge a few chapters earlier when he talks about how, how this church has expressed its freedom in Christ and has abused that freedom. They've abused knowledge and prophecy and tongues. There are limits to certain activities that we engage in. Activities that will come to an end. Activities that will no longer be needed. Paul has given gifts to the church. God has given gifts to the church for the purpose of building up the church. Proclaiming the gospel and making disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why these gifts exist. To build up the church, to proclaim the gospel, to make disciples. And there is going to come a time when these gifts are no longer needed. In verse 12, Paul refers to this limitation, the limitation of our knowledge as seeing in a mirror dimly. Authentic love, however, is enduring because it is more than a gift. It's not less than, it is more than a gift. It is the very expression of of what God has given us through Jesus Christ. Because it comes from God, it is limitless in its time and in its effect. It will endure. Authentic love is enduring and it exceeds the limitations of activities. Next, notice that authentic love expresses itself through maturity. We see this in verse 11. Paul says, when I was a child, I used to think like a child, speak like a child, reason like a child, but when I became a man, I did away with childish things. When Paul speaks of a child, he's referring to someone who was probably the, like a toddler. Someone who was old enough to not be an infant, but not quite mature enough to be called an adult. It is a word here that can also be 
referred to as being childish. That's the way he uses it also in this, ver in this verse. It is not like the childlike simplicity that Jesus asks us to come to him with. Instead, it is a sense of immaturity in our speech, in our thoughts, and in our decisions, acting immaturely. When we reflect on the characteristics of love, that love is supposed to possess or perhaps not possess, for instance, jealousy, boasting, arrogance, rudeness, selfishness, irritability, resentment, all of these things we could easily categorize as childish behavior. Something that is reflective of somebody who is immature. Love puts away those things. Paul says, when he became a man, he put away childish things. Love embraces maturity in the best and most self, selfless sense of the word. It speaks, it thinks, it reasons in a way that seeks God's interests and the interests of others first. Our understanding is limited and what we perceive is limited as well. However, there will come a time when such limitations will go away. And we will see and we will know even as we are seen and known. And that is an exciting thing to think about. True maturity recognizes this and lives in love without without thinking about itself, it lives in love out of a reflection of what we know is coming. The final thing we see in chapter 13, the last way that we know that love is enduring comes from verse 13. Authentic love, we can say, exceeds all else. It exceeds even some very good things. Paul writes, but now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Paul, in a way, has already touched on faith and hope when he says that love believes all things. He is using a word, a verb connected to the word faith. It has faith in all things. And when he says that love hopes all things, again, he is using the verb form for hope. Faith and hope are very good things. They are very necessary things for us as believers. Hebrews, 6, uh, Hebrews 11 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. We know as well through scripture that we are saved by grace through faith and not on account of our works. Again in Hebrews we see hope mentioned in Hebrews 6 verses 19 and 20 the writer says this, this, this hope we have is an anchor for our souls, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one who enters the veil, that is coming into the presence of God the Father, where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. We have a confidence that we can come because of this hope that we have. However, faith and hope are limited because they presume, they assume that something is unseen. Hebrews 11.1, 1, for instance, speaks of faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen. Romans 8.24 says, For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. 
For who hopes on what he already sees? There will come a time where faith and hope will not be necessary. Why? Because, as Paul says in verse 12, we will fully know even as we are fully known. We will see even as we are seen. The unseen will be gone. Love, on the other hand, is enduring because it is central to the character and identity of God. John writes in 1 John 4, 16, We have come to know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. It endures. Love is more enduring than faith and hope because love is the very thing we receive from God. It is the very thing that we receive from Him and that we reflect back to God and to one another. As Christians, we are part of a body that is bigger than any of us individually. This body is made up of a bunch of individual parts and gifts that form initially this community of faith that we call Canyon Bible Fellowship. It is made up of churches generally here in, San, in the Santiam Canyon. It is seen in our sister churches that stretch from here in Lyons out to Newport throughout the Pacific Northwest and around the world. Not unlike the army that I joined 30 years ago, it serves a common mission. We have a common mission. It is a mission that is bigger and broader and more important than any of us could ever hope to accomplish on our own. We are called to be driven by the gospel, to be focused on the authority of Scripture, to make disciples and to be committed to pursuing a right relationship with God and with one another. In this, we can properly say that there is a so-called right way, a so-called wrong way, or there is God's way. How we carry out this mission that God has given us is just as vital as the fact that we carry it out. The right means and the right end and the right means is that we carry it out in love as God defines it. And that is the necessary way. But we can't do this on our own. So how do we do it? First of all, we have to humbly acknowledge that our own sin, the sin that we've inherited and the sin that we've engaged in prevents us from loving God and loving one another as we should. It begins there. We are sinners by nature and by choice. So, God the Father sent God the Son Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in obedience to the will of the Father, came to earth, taking on the very nature of a human and the very nature of a servant. In His perfect obedience, what we call Christ's active obedience, He perfectly fulfills the law. In doing so, Jesus became our righteousness. In His death, Jesus took on the punishment for us, the punishment that should have been ours, the judgment of God that is prepared for those who sin against Him. Jesus took that on Himself, what we call Jesus' passive obedience. Jesus, obe Jesus being perfectly obedient to the will of the Father. Jesus 
on the cross takes the judgment that should have been ours. In His resurrection, Jesus confirmed that His ministry on earth was complete. He rose from the dead. Death has no more power over Him. And death has no more power over those who confess Jesus' name. In His ascension, Jesus returned to the Father where He sits at God's right hand, giving us access to the Father for those who are found in Christ. For those who acknowledge this, we now receive God's love as well as the promise of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us and gives us the ability to love Him and to love others as we should, to fulfill that mission in the proper way. It is this essential element in our relationships that is a, this essential element of selfless affection to one another that we receive. And it is because of what God has provided that we can now love even as we have been loved. I think it's appropriate that we are able to end this series this way. And that is with a demonstration of God's love. So as Kira comes up, we're, we have the privilege of using something I've never used before here at this church to to engage in baptism, so Kira, you can come up. So, I remember the first time I had a conversation with Kira, I think it was a couple of years ago, when she initially wanted to be baptized and we couldn't quite make it happen then. And so, a few months ago, she comes to me and corners me in my office, and we have this. Um, so, we'll have you turn around the other way. You'll go back this way. Um, so, anyway, it's it's just been an honor for me over the last few weeks to be able to meet with Kira, to meet with Connie, and to talk about what baptism is, what it isn't, and to hear her talk about her the love for God that she's received and that the love for God that she's growing in. So with that, uh, I want Kira to share a little bit about her testimony in her own words. Um, and then we've got a few questions to ask and then we'll have the privilege of baptizing her. Is it unmuted? <laughs> check, check. A little more game. Check, check, test. Hang on to it. All right. Speak out. All right, project. For the most part, I didn't really have a religious upbringing. As a kid, I thought that church was just where you would go to play and not to learn about God. I didn't really understand or take it seriously until a few months ago when I started my journey on learning about God more. And I can't say that I've ever made a better decision. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to let you use my mic as I ask you these three questions. You've already seen them, so. Um, so first question, do you believe that you were born a sinner who de deserves to be judged by God? Yes. Do you believe that God the Father sent his son Jesus to die and to be raised from the dead for your sins? Yes. With the help of the Holy Spirit, do you desire to grow more in your new relationship with God and His people? Yes. Okay. You're going to stand up for a second. All right. All right. So, with that, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
All right, buried, uh, buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. All right. With that, what a, what a joyous way to celebrate this new life. I would, my challenge to us as a church is that we come alongside Kira and look for those opportunities where we can encourage her and challenge her to grow in this new life. So with that... With that, we do invite you to join us for uh, one of the things that we Baptists like to do a lot, and that's eat. Uh, so we have food in the fellowship hall, and I'll pray. This will also double as the prayer for the food, so uh, you don't have to wait for me to do that again. Uh, so I do appreciate, I know that Kira uh, appreciates everybody here and uh, appreciate having her family here to celebrate this very special day for her. So with that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and grace. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came as our substitute. That because of his death, for those who embrace him, we no longer stand under judgment. But we are made righteous. We are made clean. We have a new life that death has no more authority, no more power over us. God, I pray for Kira that you would continue to work in her, that this new life that she has would continue to grow, that, as the Apostle Paul said, that she would not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of for it is your power unto salvation to all who believe. God, I pray that we, as your church, as your family, would come alongside Kira to encourage her, to strengthen her, to challenge her, so that this new life that she has would not die, this light that she has would not grow dim but that she would have a reason, she would be able to give a reason for the hope that is within her. Thank you for being able to rejoice in this, rejoice with her. God, I pray that you would be ever present with us, that we would be aware of your presence evermore, day by day. Bless us as we go from here. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>